Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ashland. We'll be starting today with the computer science basics, computer awareness uh, concepts for the mains examination for Focus IBPS mains 2018. Okay. So computer science is now a part of the reasoning section. So we have reasoning and computer aptitude as one section. So if you see the reasoning section now has 45 questions, right? Out of which we expect a maximum 5 to 10 questions from computer science. Earlier computer awareness was a part of the GK section. So there would be a separate 20 question section on computer awareness in addition to GK, but now computer aptitude or computer awareness is a part of the reasoning section of the examination. And uh, currently we see around 5, 6 maximum we can expect around 10 questions. So in reasoning we have 45 questions as compared to mathematics which has still got around 35 questions. So now what can come in computer science? Is there a defined syllabus for that? We will say no. We do not have a very clearly defined syllabus. If you look at the last year paper, we will say that there were questions based on base system that means hexadecimal, binary, decimal, base conversion. There were questions based on logic gate right? and some concepts of database management system DBM. But we will say largely what has come in banking exams before and what could be defined as the uh, structure of the banking examination section, we will say that uh, we can start with basics of computers first. You know, So a person should be familiar with the basic concepts of computers. Then we can go ahead and understand the concept of the Microsoft Office. We can look at the concept of computer networking in which we can also look at the flow chart concept and entity relationship diagram that is there. And uh, then we can also focus on the concepts of operating system and we have logic gates, Boolean algebra, all of these things base system. So we will be dividing the entire syllabus of computer science through seven different sessions in which we will be covering important concepts for you which can be a part of the examination. right? So all the uh, concepts that we are going to do are very important and extremely useful for the examination. So pay attention, note down whatever we are covering for you and accordingly you can uh, plan and prepare for your examination. So to start first we will uh, say what is the goal for the class. So in today's session, the first session on computer awareness, we are going to discuss computer architecture, input output devices, storage devices, types of computers. So these are the four key concepts that we are going to cover in the class today. Computer architecture, input output devices, storage devices and types of computers. Right, so four concepts that are going to be discussed in the class today. Let us quickly start with the computer architecture and uh, let us just look at this what exactly comes in computer architecture. Computer architecture we are not going to deal with the advanced concepts, the basic layout, the block diagram. So what we are talking here is basically the block diagram of the computer. So we have block diagram in which different uh, parts of the computer we have here. So what we see is one is the input unit through which data comes in and then the output unit is where the data information goes out. Then we have the CPU, all these things are quite simple and I am sure that most of you have studied in your school or college days. The CPU which stands for the central processing unit which contains your control unit CU, the full form of CU is control unit and ALU arithmetic and logic unit. Right. So whenever, okay, before that let us first just discuss the block diagram. So we have the storage unit here. The storage unit is where we have the primary storage or the primary memory and secondary storage or the secondary memory. Right. When there is any information that comes through the primary memory, it goes to the control unit and it goes to the CPU. You can see the diagram here. So first we get the input to the storage unit. It goes into let us say your RAM. From RAM, we send the data to the CPU, which is the brain of the computer. It has to do all the calculation that are required in the computer. Inside the CPU also, we have two control unit, which basically controls the entire device. And then we have arithmetic and logical unit. So if any mathematical operation has to be done, the data is passed from the CU, that is control unit, to the registers into the ALU arithmetic and logic unit where the calculations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division are done and then the data goes back to the control unit and from the control unit it goes to the storage unit and from the storage unit it goes to the output where we get the information. 
that is the basic understanding of the block diagram of how the computer works in a very simple way. So, to understand the main concepts of the block diagram again, we have input unit and output unit. We have the CPU control central processing unit which contains two things, the control unit and the ALU. ALU does most of the, uh, ALU does all the mathematical calculations and then in the storage unit we have two things primary and secondary storage that we will be discussing in detail as we progress in this particular session okay so this is a brief understanding of the block diagram of the computer let's move to now the input devices so first we'll be looking at all the input devices the first one is the punch card a very old type of input method in which there would be a card uh, dates back to the late 18th and early 19th century so it's a very very old in 1880s or 1890s uh, there would be a card as you can see on the screen in which uh, people would punch the numbers which provides the input and it will go to a punch card reader and from the punch card reader that information would then pass on to the calculating device and from the calculating device the calculation would be done and then data would be again output will be created this is this was invented by Herman Hollerith but this would be an advanced concept it can maybe come sometimes in the GK part of the examination just understand briefly about what is punch card so different input devices will be looking at one by one just so you can get a brief overview of the different input devices so maybe if the question comes in the examination which of the following is not an input device you can answer the question clear so that is about punch card then we have keyboard keyboard is something that all of you use every day uh, while using a computer browsing the internet right working on microsoft word or simply using your desktop pcs or laptops or even in your mobile phones we have a keyboard right so keyboard contains the keys through which user can provide input to the computer you can understand here this is a QWERT keyboard so we call it a QWERT because of these keys here being in that order QWERT uh, we should know this this is the space bar I am sure you know this concept the basic keys you should know definitely this is the space bar letters keys are here these are all the letter keys right so here q to u and then a to l y to m these are all the letter keys that you use in your day to day life for typing something in the computer uh, this is the shift key this is the right shift key and this is the left shift key and this is the old design of a keyboard an ibm keyboard so just to make you understand this is the left shift so left shift is represented by the up arrow because it, the shift key is used for typing capital letters typing special characters right for example if you want to type the dollar symbol here which is above the number 6 you will need the shift key clear the so typing of special characters and typing the letters in upper case we use the shift key so it is uh, represented by an upward arrow please understand in the old design today it is simply written as shift but in the older design of keyboard it was represented by an upward arrow then we have the left alt key this is the alt key again used for printing special characters using the ascii code control plus alt plus the ascii code right this is the alt gr that is the alt graph or what we also called as a right alt key right then we have the control key okay so this is the control key ctrl control key and uh, this is the caps lock basically capital lock you know caps lock the purpose of this was to have a permanent down shift key that is why you see it is represented by a down arrow because every time you have to type something in upper case you can't keep pressing the shift key so there was a key required that would act like a permanently pressed shift key and that is why the arrow was pointing down that is this key is pressed means the shift key is pressed it is used for typing upper case letters then we have the numbers here 1 to 9 and then the characters here we have the function keys these are very important to know the function key this is the escape key clear and then we have the arrow keys here which you can take the left cursor to the left right or to move something around the window we use the arrow keys we have also have the print screen we have the uh, indicators here this is the numpad so basic understanding of the laptop we should know 
uh, this is the enter key or the return key it's also called as the return key because when you are returning you press this uh, the value goes to the next line so these are all the things we have the page up page down home print screen so you can see here this is the print screen key pause key right then we also have the num lock so if you want to use the num pad you can press the num lock and start using the num pad so understanding basic layout of the keyboard deck this can be a very likely question and many this is the backspace right so we should know about the basic layout of the regular keyboard that we have in our computer be familiar with the main keys that are there so that if a question comes in the examination you can answer it so what we'll do now is just take you through a quick review of the function keys the function keys what are the different function keys and how they are used in different settings in browser how do we use a function key in uh, let's say windows uh, microsoft windows or excel how do we use the function keys a quick review of that so first we look at function key 1 f1 is always for help simply understand if i press right now i'm taking this session for you uh, the slide if i press the f1 key the help will open you see the help has opened here so if you want we can close the help screen or we can escape we can close the help screen by clicking on this okay and you can see this is given to me all the different help options while taking the session using the powerpoint clear so wherever you are in your in your chrome browser or you are in microsoft word or anything that you are doing if you press the f1 key the universal help key uh, if you press the windows key plus f1 it will open the windows help center shift plus f1 will reveal formatting in microsoft word if you're typing something you want to reveal the formatting then you have to use shift plus f1 and control plus f1 opens task pane in microsoft office so very very useful key you should learn about the f1 key next look at f2 key is the basically rename key you want to rename so f1 is help f2 is rename understand these main things about these keys okay f1 is help f2 is rename f3 is find so f2 means you click on any uh, icon or a folder icon and then you just press f2 it will ask you it will allow you to rename the folder clear yeah, so that's the main part also while the uh, system is booting up if you press f2 key it will take you to the bios setup right the basic input output set setup of the computer where you can change the order in which the boot devices are working and do a lot of other important advanced concepts while uh the booting is being done so basically what it gives you is the uh, re, it's a rename key in in windows uh, microsoft word is very important it helps you in the print preview by typing something you want to quickly see the print preview press the control plus f2 and it will show you the print preview again you press it once more it will close the print preview clear so that's a very important key now f1 and f2 followed by f3 so f3 is search understand wherever you are in a browser or in microsoft word use f3 it will open the search pane you use shift plus f3 it will change something from upper case to lower case in microsoft word so there's a shortcut key in microsoft word to change the letter from upper case to lower case what is the shortcut key shift plus f3 like that also question can come in the examination okay so remember f1 is for help f2 is for rename f3 is for search that's the basic function of f1 f2 and f3 let's look at f4 it is used to do what to close a program so if a program is open and if i press alt f4 now it will close this program so alt f4 is to close the running program if no program is open it will help you shut down the computer it will open the shut down option window clear so that is the f4 key shut down or close f5 key is refresh you are in a browser or you are doing something you want to refresh the settings if you refresh the browser you can use the f5 key and f5 also refreshes the window in microsoft word in the explorer windows explorer it is also used for find and replace in microsoft word so if you are typing in microsoft word and you want to find something or replace something you want to open the find replace dialog box then you can press the f5 key clear yeah, that function key f5 so f6 takes you to the address bar So you are in a browser. You want to quickly go and type something in the address bar. You don't want to use a mouse or the touchpad on your laptop. You just press the F6 key, and it will take you to the address bar in the browser. Clear? So important keys. F4 is very frequently used to close a program or to shut down the computer. F5 very frequently used for refresh. 
So, F1, F2, F3, F4 and F5 are used very frequently, F6, F7, F8, F9, these are used less. What is F7? Usually when you have to uh, check this spelling and grammar in Microsoft Word, you click on that and you go to the uh, you know menu bar and you can do the check the spelling and grammar, but if you want to save time, just press F7 and it will open the spelling and grammar dialog box, the, uh, the window in Microsoft Word, F8 starts window in safe mode. So, when the system is booting, you can press F8 and it will give you the safe mode options like open windows in safe mode, open windows in safe mode with networking. So, these will give you the safe mode options and help you start the windows in safe mode. In safe mode, it, uh, the windows basic uh, operating system is uh, loaded and there you can do a lot of th program like administrator controls are there, you want to remove viruses or something like that, it is very helpful. And in Microsoft Word or Excel or PowerPoint, if you press Alt plus F8, it will open the macros window, right. Macros are a step of programmed, uh, something that you have programmed and you can repeat it in your Microsoft Word, normally used for you can say formatting, very useful in formatting and other purposes are there for the macros concept in Microsoft Office. So, all plus F4, <coughs> F8 opens the macros windows, you can see all the macros that you have stored in the computer and in the in the windows uh, application software and you can use that. F9 is to update document in Microsoft Word, also to send and receive uh, mail in Microsoft Outlook. So, you see F7, F8, F9, F6, these are less used. In our day to day life, we do not use them much. We use F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, help, rename, find, close and refresh. These are F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7, F8, F9 less. When we are using the system, we use it less often, so we do not know much about them. F10 is to open the menu bar. Uh, it also acts as right click. That is a very important thing, very important piece of information for you. Shift plus F10 works exactly like the right uh, you know a click of the mouse. So, if I take a mouse and I do a right click here, it will open these options that I can use. So, if I do not want to use the mouse, then I want to use shift plus F10, then the same options opening. See, if I am pressing shift plus F10, the same options are opening. So, it shows you how the if the mouse is not working and if you want to use the right click, you can use shift plus F10 and then next we have F11 enters or exits full screen mode in a browser. So, if you press F11, it will become full screen mode in the browser. Also, while working Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, if you want to open the visual basic editor, in Excel also we can use that visual basic editor, then you can press the Alt plus F11 and finally, the F12 key is the save as uh, window is open. So, if you are working on a document, you want to save it as something. Then or you want to save a copy of the document with a different name, then you can use F12, very helpful, Use uh, try using F12, we will see all of these keys, when you know about these keys, it makes your entire experience using your computer, particularly Microsoft Windows so much easier for you. Uh, so, these are the 12 function keys, remember the 5 main keys F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, they can come in the examination, other keys also you can get a quick review. Let us look at other input devices, mouse is there, inventor of mouse, Douglas and Engelbert, so that is one info information for you. Uh, joystick is normally used in games for controlling, it is easier to control operations in a games if you use a joystick. So, these are all input devices. Then we have trackball, again the purpose of trackball is the pointing device. So, a mouse or a, a joystick or a trackball or a touchpad, these are all pointing devices plus we can do various things on the computer screen by using these as input devices, selecting something, moving something around, you know. So, touchpad again in laptop, it was used first in 1988, people, less people do not uh, know about it, it was invented in 1988 and also Apple computer was the first, so this also I have mentioned here, Apple computer was the first to license it and use the touchpad in its power book laptops in 1994, so first time in a laptop when it was used. It was in 1994 and it was the laptop by the Apple computer company. So, touchpad is something that today we all are familiar with. In all the laptops, we have touchpad and uh, it is a very helpful way of using the pointer option in the laptop. So, let us continue with other input devices. So, today what is more important for us? A touch screen. A touch screen becomes uh, today the standard way of giving input even in uh, computers, 
desktops also are coming with touch screen now and we had mobile phones. The first mobile phone was IBM Simon launched in 1992 which had a touch screen phone. The first touch screen phone not mobile phone the first touch screen phone was IBM Simon launched in 1992. Now, here normally by putting some pressure on the pad user can, can give information. Today it is very popular and prevalent everywhere all of you are familiar with how a mobile touch screen works. Graphic tablet you can connect it to a computer a laptop or a desktop and you can write on the screen using the graphic tablet normally used by designers is a very helpful way of uh, for doing creative work in a computer. Now, look at a scanner and an OMR these are also input devices a scanner we can put a document inside the scanner there is a glass and beneath which we can scan the document and that document can then be transferred to a computer. So, again used frequently a scanner and OMR in exams earlier when exams are not online we used to get an OMR sheet that is optical mark recognition sheet in which you can you can see the diagram here a mark sheet is there you can write A, B, C, D and pass it through the OMR reader which will take the input from the OMR sheet and pass it to the computer. So, it is also an input device next we will look at the output devices. Right. So, output devices they display information to you they, they present information to the viewer it can be in a print copy a hard copy output or it can be a soft copy output on the screen. The most common output devices are printers let us look at different types of character printers in printers also we have different types of printers uh, character printer line printer we have page printers so, we will see each of the printers separately first we look at printers character printers more like a keyboard like this is what is called a daisy wheel printer it is an impact printer it has a fixed font type it cannot print graphics the three important part points about daisy wheel printer uh, is almost like a electronic keyboard you can say a typewriter where we have different types of keys it is got in a wheel and you can print it uh, by putting the impression on a piece of paper this is an impact printer it is a fixed font type you cannot change the font type and it cannot print graphics. Next one which is very commonly used today also all this from a long time is a dot matrix printer it uses a hammer and ribbon technology for uh, printing letters and dots on the screen and because it can print dots it can also print graphics ok. It can be used for printing images although there will be small small dots that you can see visibly on the image and uh, it is faster than a daisy wheel printer mainly used for what mainly use of printing multiple copies of form. So, for example, you go to a store and you purchase something right and they give you a receipt of that particular purchase there will be multiple copies with the carbon sheet in between and it passes uh, through the uh, dot matrix printer and it prints multiple copies of that receipt one copy can be given to you and one copy the shopkeeper can retain with himself right. So, that is a very very relevant use of dot matrix printer which only dot matrix printers can do laser printers cannot do in laser printers will have to print two copies one after the other one for the customer copy one for the shopkeeper's copy clear if you want to print it only once then you have to use a dot matrix printer. So, quite in use even today and you can see it being used in railway counters and many other offices you will find the use of dot matrix printer ok. Next we have the inkjet printer. So, what is this printer the inkjet printer uses a different stream of inks basically it is a non impact printer clear the print characters by spraying small drops of ink onto the paper the so, different colored inks can be there and by the combination of these inks very beautiful colorful images can be printed. But this is also a character printer one character at a time it prints if you look at the way an ink that printer is working you will see that it is printing one character at a time. So, it takes a lot of time so the only one of the main drawbacks is that it is a little slow in terms of the way it prints it can print finer smoother details a very high resolution of print. So, if you see uh, people who print uh, photographs they normally use the inkjet printer clear. So, very nice printer uh, it is uh, cheaper to buy and uh, the only drawback is that it uh, is very time taking. So, to print thousands and thousands of copies of something then inkjet printer is definitely not this solution for you you have to look for something better right. So, what do we do then if you are not uh, you want something faster 
then you do not have to print character by character. So, inkjet printer and the previous ones we have seen dot matrix, right, daisy wheel, these are all character printers. Then we have the line printer which prints one line at a time, clear. So, one of the such printers is a drum printer. It uses a solid cylindrical drum which contains complete rays character set in each band around the cylinder, mostly used in presses, newspaper press and other such things where bulk printing is done and uh, number of bands are equal to number of printing positions, each band contains all the possible characters. So, this is what is the drum printer, it drum rolls and prints one line at a time, clear. That is what we mean by a line printer not used so commonly in offices, in offices we either use inkjet or we use a laser printer, a page printer. You see a laser printer, so now we have seen three types of printers primarily, one is character printer, one is line printer and one is laser printer, it is a non impact printer, it is a, it prints one page at a time and they are very costly initially, but economical only when you print large quantities of something. And when you print in bulk, it is very, it's very fast, it uses electrophotographic techniques, right, very similar to a scanner, they scans the document and prints it, something like that, you know. So, in this printers an image is produced on a photosensitive surface using a laser beam of other light source. That is why it is called a laser printer, it is very fast and in the long run it is very economical. So, the cost of printing per page comes down in the long run, but initially it is expensive to buy when compared with an inkjet printer, clear. So, different types of printers we have seen, uh, character, line and page in character we have seen three types, the daisy wheel printer which is an impact printer, then we have the dot matrix printer which is also an impact printer and uh, dot matrix can print graphics, but daisy wheel cannot print graphics, whereas dot matrix normally used for printing forms, multiple copies of forms, you will see it used quite often in railway stations and other government offices and even in shops sometimes when they are giving a receipt of your purchase. Then we have seen the character printer that is inkjet printer, it sprays ink on the piece of paper to print something, but it prints character by character, not the entire line by line or page by page. So, it is really slow, but it is less expensive and it prints high resolution. Then we saw the line printer which is a drum printer and then we have this laser printer which is used very frequently in offices when you go to different types of photocopy centers, you will find them using laser printers, clear. And then we have plotters, so the next output device is the plotter. A plotter is also a printing devices, but used for what mainly printing vector graphics. Normally, if you want to print something on a large sheet of paper, as you can see in the image here, normally used in computer aided design, plotters are used for they are very fast and produce very large drawings. So, what is a plotter? It is like a printer only, it is a printer, but normally used for to do what printing vector graphics, large sheets of paper used in architecture in computer aided design that is what is called a plotter. Next we will look at output devices. So, output devices let us just see there are four main types of output devices that you are familiar with. One is the cathode ray tube, the big fat bulky computer sets that we had earlier in till the year 2002, 3, 4. Uh, those are called the cathode ray tubes very much like the old uh, television uh, displays also clear. Yeah? In which there is a vacuum tube where cathode ray would be there and it would be there would be a curved screen. Uh, later on we had the CRT with flat screen also and through that cathode ray and vacuum tube images would be displayed on the screen. It would consume lot of power and it was very bulky. So, then the later technologies, better technologies using less power, better quality picture, wider picture that is when liquid crystal display LCD. So, that can also come as a question in the exam, what is the full form of LCD? It is a liquid crystal display, there are two layers of polarized glass, you know, between which liquid crystals are there and then we pass a light through it, clear. And normally in LCD fluorescent light is used and the light goes through it depending upon what image has to be produced, different uh, light goes through it and the pixels, polarization of the layers will decide what image will come on the screen. So, basic idea is that it uses two polarized glass through which liquid crystals block and pass light and allow the image to come on the screen, very high quality image, high resolution image can be seen on the screen and it is thin, it is not big fat, it is thin, all of you are familiar with LCDs and uses less power also. 
So, what is the next one that LED that is basically a short form of light emitting diodes ok. A diode is a semiconductor device and the light emitting diode. So, LCDs and LEDs both use the same technology the only difference is that so in LEDs also we have two layers of polarized glass with liquid crystals in between and light is passed through those liquid crystals they which they try to block or allow the light to pass and that is how they present something on the screen clear. So, uh, okay. so LED light emitting diodes use the same technology as LCD that is one thing that you should remember. The only difference is that here the light is being produced by LEDs which can come from behind the screen or from the side of the screen also whereas in LCD light should always come from behind the screen and the fluorescent light is used whereas in LED what is light? Light is produced through the light emitting diodes that is the difference between this and TFT is a kind of technology. So, the full form of TFT first of all you will see thin film transistor. So, what is the TFT? It is a thin film transistor and a TFT is created by combining thin films on a semiconductor active layer with dielectric layer that works as an electric insulator. Basically you understand TFT is a technology that is used in LCDs or LEDs and uh, there are some types of monitors which are separately called as the TFT monitors clear is faster when you are moving the main advantage of using TFT in computers is that when you are using your cursor on the screen the movement of the cursor will be very fast very very smooth that is why in computers sometimes they use TFT screens. So, these are the different types of monitors that you have in a computer. Next we will look at memory or storage devices. So, there are three types of memory one is internal processor memory clear second is your primary memory and third is your secondary or auxiliary memory. So, it quickly if you have to understand internal mem processor memory is what the processor uses directly clear. The processor the, the CPU the central processing unit containing the CU the control unit and ALU the arithmetic and logic unit contains registers and caches in which data is stored for the processor to immediately use the data while executing a particular process or a program clear data is stored temporarily in the in the registers and the cache and it is the fastest way of accessing data for the CPU clear. So, these are registers which store data temporarily and they are inside the CPU examples are something like the uh, inst instruction queue. So, inside the processor we have something called as the instruction queue. So, that when we are trying to do multi tasking the number of processes are there right one process is exits the you know from execution we store all the information registers when it comes back into execution we load all the values and continue with the execution this is in detail when you understand computer architecture and how processes work then you will see these concepts for the time being you can understand internal processor memories are registers and caches used by the CPU very fast to access data is stored temporarily in the registers and caches. Primary memory or the main memory is again accessed by the CPU and data is loaded into the primary memory before passing it on to the CPU examples are RAM and ROM. And secondary memory or auxiliary memory is where we store data permanently because in RAM we do not store data permanently clear. So, if you want to store data permanently for longer usage then we use a secondary memory like your hard, hard drive, the USB drives or the floppy disks, the CDs, DVDs all of these are your secondary memory clear. So, let us quickly go through the different storage devices ok. So, we have internal processor memory contains high speed registers and high speed buffer memory which the internal processor can use temporary locations where actual processing is done. Primary memory RAM ROM and CMOS. So, we have random access memory the full form of RAM is random access memory the full form of ROM is the read only memory and uh, then we have the CMOS the complementary metal oxide semiconductor memory CMOS where mostly your system information is stored this is what is also called as a CMOS setup clear. So, when the computer is booting up you want to go into the CMOS setup to change the BIOS setting then you press the F2 key clear. So, that is the CMOS 
So, uh, types of RAM static and dynamic RAM clear in uh, dynamic RAM we have to keep refreshing the data in static RAM the data is there for a longer time and uh, two types of ROM. So, just know the full form of S RAM is static RAM and D RAM is dynamic RAM and types of read only memory we have two types one is manufacture programmed read only memory you know. So, uh, clear that is a read only memory and this is a manufactured program not user program. So, it is not DRAM. So, you can say this you can cancel ok. It is basically manufactured program read only memory ROM, but it is a manufactured program that means suppose for example, in a washing machine there are certain things that the manufacturer is pro has programmed and embedded into a ROM and kept it in the washing machine system which you cannot change we cannot access that is called as manufactured program read only memory clear yeah. whereas user program read only memory that is also called as program prom because it is programmable read only memory the user can program it and the two types one is erasable eprom erasable programmable read only memory and second one is electrically erasable eeprom so these are the full form of eprom eeprom and prom programmable read only memory. This is a, the diagram of kind of a, the your CMOS your mother drive in which your CMOS is there the complementary metal oxide uh, you know uh, semiconductor. So, here we have uh, it normally used for the bio system basic input output system. So, the bio system when you want to when you are booting your computer you want to go and change the order in which the drives have to be booted or you want to make other changes in the system then you have to go into the CMOS setup here yeah. and this is one diagram this is also in the kind of a, a memory primary memory. Now, we have to go into secondary memory that we are more familiar with so, starting with the floppy disk it is called a floppy disk because it flops it is very thin very light it flops and you do it like this and it is called a soft magnetic disk inside in which data can be stored, but this size the amount of data is very less that can be stored in a floppy disk right and then we have the optical disk is an electronic data storage medium that can be written to and read using a low powered laser beam clear. So, that is what is the meaning of an optical disk we have different types of optical disks that like CD-ROM, CD-ROM is <coughs> your compact disk read only memory then we have CD worm write once read many clear in CD-ROM is where we have already programmed everything data is already stored in the ROM you cannot change it. For example, let us say you buy a game CD from Microsoft or electronic arts the game is in that CD you cannot change anything in that you can just install the game and use it that is only read only memory CD ROM. But if you buy a blank CD from the market in which you can store something once so you can store it in once and use it again you cannot erase something from it then it is called as CD worm write once read many. So, it comes in a blank CD you can store something in that CD, but you cannot erase it now here. Yeah? So, write only read many then we have CD RW that is read and write that means now this is a blank CD in which you can write something that means you can store something you can erase it. So, it is erasable disk also you can erase what you have stored in that CD RW and you can rewrite on it. So, it works more like a USB device, but the amount of data that can be stored is less that is why today it is not being used so much here. Yeah? So, CD-ROM, CD-WORM and CD-RW then we have hard disk all of you are familiar today we get 1 terabyte hard disk and you know 2 terabyte hard disk. So, hard disk is a magnetic disk it is same technology that is there in floppy disk just it is more robust in which computer large amount of data can be stored in a hard disk. The fourth type of secondary memory is a magnetic tape just understand it more like the audio cassettes that were there in the past in which songs were recorded the tape or the VHS tape video tapes which are there those are examples of magnetic tapes in which data can be stored and earlier it was also used as a hard disk. So, magnetic tape magnetic tape, tape is a magnetically coated strip of plastic on which data can be encoded clear that is a magnetic tape. Next we have types of computers clear. So, we have seen input devices we have seen output devices we have seen storage devices I have taken you through quickly a complete review of the basic computer science. Let us look at the types of computers. So, first type of computer is what we call the microcomputer 
and microcomputer is something that you use in your home, your desktop, your laptop can be called a microcomputer. Another name for the microcomputer is a personal computer, clear? Next is the next level of computer in terms of computing power is the mini computers. Mini computer has more computing power than a micro computer which is largely used for personal computing. These have larger 8256 memory storage location developed in the mid 1960s and between the mainframe and the mid size computers right or the large computers we have this mini computers. So, maybe in, uh, in businesses they can use if there is a huge business they want a server. The server can be considered as a mini computer because it is connecting a number of computers in the office, right. The server can be a good example of a mini computer. Then mainframe is a larger computer than the mini computer or mid size computer we can call it or even it can be a large computer that name can be given to as a mainframe. Basically it can do huge, com it is huge computing power and large uh, storage capacity normally used in businesses, government, banks, defense in these things it has the capacity to process very large amount of data in less time clear and finally the biggest computers the large computers are the super computers giant computers with huge processing power used in let's say nasa or defense or other places where huge computing capacity is required billion or even trillion of calculations can be done as per required using a super computer right the first super computer developed by india was called param Param computer. So, microcomputer we use, mini computers offices can use, server can be example of a mini computer, main frames, large businesses, large corporations, banks, railways, uh, government they can be using main frames and super computer very large processing capacity used in defense, in research, in science, advanced calculations where lot of calculations are required. Now, this is types of computers in terms of size and in terms of processing capacity. Uh, in terms of usage also we can define types of computers, types of personal computers, one is your desktop PC, the basic computer which comes with a monitor, there is a cabinet, right, there is a monitor, a cabinet, a keyboard and a mouse, correct. So, the cabinet is which contains all of the, uh, the entire system is in the cabinet, the hard disk is there, the RAM is there, the motherboard is there, the CPU is there, right all of these things are in the cabinet. Then we have the monitor, the screen on which we see images or we can work on different types of uh, word sheet and excel sheet on the screen that is the monitor, the keyboard and the mouse are input devices. We can connect a speaker and lots of other peripherals to the cabinet. Laptops, compact portable small computers in which everything is there in one block which contains your cabinet it contains everything there and there is a thin screen and it can sit on a lap that is why it is called a laptop and it is nowadays also called notebooks that is a more common name nowadays for a laptop it is called a notebook clear. A handhold, a handheld palm top a smaller version of laptop which can be held in your hand. Today we can say all our smartphones are nothing but handheld computers. Then we had personal digital assistant before smartphones came into picture we had the personal digital assistant PDAs, handy portable computers that we could work around with ourselves, clear. What smartphones basically did was that they joined, they combined the, the functioning of a phone and a functioning of a PDA, personal digital assistant in one device and that is why they were called the smartphone, right. Then we have the tablet PCs, again something that the modern uh, person you as a user will be familiar with this different types of tablets. It is like a smaller than a laptop, clear. Some of the things that are there in a, a laptop but not there in a tablet could be the uh, optical disk drive is not there in a tablet, where, uh, in, in a tablet but whereas in most laptops the optical disk drive is there. Although today we also have laptops which are a bridge between laptops and tablets, okay, which do not contain an optical disk drive. Tablets normally have a touch screen uh, you know input uh, method whereas laptops come with a keyboard but today again we have laptops which have both functionalities. Today we have laptops which also have touch screen on them. Now workstation is a powerful computer, a personal computer, uh, more power, more capacity in terms of processing, more capacity in terms of storage, right. That is what is called a workstation for example, a heavy desktop built for gaming or for doing lots of calculation or for doing uh, graphics and video editing, right. 
require a powerful desktop that could be called a workstation. Normally, it is used in the offices for work purpose and that is why they call as workstations. And then we have a server, it is again another name for a personal computer. The name server comes from its purpose rather than what it is, you know. The, any computer can be used as a server. A server is where we host something. We store something and that is connected to a client and we pass information from the server to the client. One computer can be connected to a number of computers in the office through a LAN system and that main computer, the primary computer which is connecting all of the other computers is called the server, clear. So, types of personal computers also we have done a quick review. Most of these things are uh, things that you are familiar with. It is not that you are not familiar with, we are just presenting it in a systematic order to see how you can revise your basic computer science in around 45 minutes to have a good understanding and so that if any question comes from this, you should be able to solve and get the answer in the examination. So, we have very quick review of basic computer science today we have done with the uh, computer architecture, the block diagram of computers, then all the input devices from the uh, you know time from the 19, early 19.